Hello, welcome back. And hello again for the final reflection in this series on a living gospel. In talking about some of the saints and holy people that we've discussed, I hope it's clear that my my purpose is that you may be inspired to think more deeply about your own life. Uh, I have myself in preparing these talks and in sharing them with you. Uh, and today I'll be focusing on that in particular. I began the series of reflections with words from Pope Francis, a personal creed he wrote at the time of his ordination in 1969 that included the line, I believe in my life story. That story, regarded in the light of the story of Jesus, is the substance of what I've been talking about in looking at the lives of holy people in our own lives as a living gospel. I want to begin my conclusions today by referring to another text by Pope Francis, this time from an extraordinary interview he gave in 2013, some months after his election as Pope. There he shared his views on the church, a field hospital, his views on the confessional, not a torture chamber, his feelings about a gay person who sincerely seeks God, who am I to judge? his love of opera, the films of Fellini, the art of Chagall, and his dogmatic certainty that, quote, God is in every person's life. Among the points that received less attention, though I immediately thought it provided a key to the Pope's thinking on many subjects, was his distinction between what he called a lab or laboratory faith and a journey faith. Quote, there is always the lurking danger of living in a laboratory, Ours is not a lab faith, but a journey faith, a historical faith. God has revealed himself as history, not as a compendium of abstract truths. That distinction immediately struck me as one of the most fruitful ideas I'd heard in a long time, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since then. In a lab faith, everything is certain and mathematical. The greatest threats come from relativism, doubt, and uncertainty. But such a faith can be inflexible, ill-prepared to deal with the messiness of life or the nature of reality. Presuming that all the answers are theoretically knowable in advance, a lab faith may leave us impervious to the surprising promptings of the Holy Spirit. Francis gives a concrete example. He says, when he was 21, he had a life-threatening lung infection. While he was in the hospital, his life was saved by the quick thinking of a nurse. Quote, the doctor, who really was a good one, lived in his laboratory. The sister lived on the frontier and was in dialogue with it every day. Laboratories are useful, but reflection for us must always start from experience. In contrast to a lab faith, a journey faith is at home on the frontier, starting with experience rather than with abstract truths. It's constantly open to uncertainty and risk. If a lab faith prizes certainty, a journey faith values trust, patience, a capacity to endure or even embrace uncertainty. This is where the Ignatian principle of discernment comes in, which is really about how to make one's way and form decisions in the face of uncertainty. Such discernment, the Pope says, redeems the necessary ambiguity of life and helps us find the most appropriate means, which do not always coincide with what looks great and strong. A journey faith is best described, he says, in terms of narrative. Describing the vocation of a Jesuit, Pope Francis says, the society of Jesus can be described only in narrative form, only in narrative form to discern, not in a philosophical or theological explanation. The Jesuit must be a person whose thought is incomplete in the sense of open-ended, and that pushes the society to be searching, creative, and generous. Clearly what Pope Francis describes as a Jesuit trait also points to his ideal for all Christians. In a journey faith, there is much that is unknown. The truth emerges through experience, through context, through relationships. It implies the capacity for change or conversion to discover new and unfamiliar truths. I thought about that in terms of American literature, where one of the best depictions of a Journey faith can be found in Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. It's set on an actual journey. It tells the story of Huck, a young boy who's 
run away from an abusive father in a world of corruption and hypocrisy, and his relationship with Jim, a runaway slave with whom he shares a raft on the Mississippi River. In principle, Huck accepts the moral code of his slave-owning society, a morality supported by a certain false version of Christianity. According to this code, it is not just a crime, but a sin to assist in the escape of a slave. Insofar as he is doing just that, Huck experiences shame and remorse and fears that he is bound to go to hell, but at a certain point he comes to recognize Jim as a fellow human being, a friend who inspires trust, loyalty, and even love. In the course of his journey, he becomes open to a different kind of truth. The moral climax of the novel comes when Huck is preparing to cleanse his soul by writing a letter to Jim's owner telling her where to find her slave. But then, quote, He got to thinking about our trip down the river and see Jim before me all the time, in the day and in the nighttime, sometimes moonlight, sometimes storms, and we are floating along, talking and singing and laughing. He remembers Jim's kindness and tenderness toward him, how he would, quote, always call me honey and pet me and do everything he could think of for me and how good he always was. And then he considers the letter in his hand. I was a-trembling because I got to decide forever betwixt two things, and I knowed it. I studied it a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then says to myself, All right, then, I'll go to hell, and tore it up. Huck has discovered a higher truth in the morality of his society, a Christian ethic that justifies owning human beings and offers a $200 reward for the return. Through discernment, he has discovered what it means, as the Pope says, to have a big heart open to God and to others. A similar story which has had a great impact on my life is the story of Franz Jaeger's daughter, the single Catholic layman executed in Austria for refusing to serve in Hitler's army. Certainly a study of, you could call it, meeting God along the path. In his youth, Franz had earned a reputation for rowdiness, but after his marriage, his neighbors observed a growing seriousness about his faith. He and his wife had two children. He adopted another child he had previously fathered out of wedlock. He became a third-order Franciscan and served as a sexton in his local parish. But how did this farmer, alone in his village, and evidently in his whole country, come to see so clearly that any compromise with the Nazi system, which he believed was a satanic movement, would imperil his immortal soul? Facing conscription, he knew he would be required to swear an oath of allegiance to the Fuhrer, and he went to seek pastoral advice, first with his local priest and later with his bishop. They advised him that such political questions were not his responsibility. His primary duty was to his fatherland and to his family. As for the larger moral issues, he should leave those in God's hands. Of course, the bishop who offered this advice was no different from anyone else. It is doubtful that any bishop in the world at that time would have counseled him otherwise. Nevertheless, he could not be persuaded by these arguments. In the gospel, he had found a higher truth that contradicted the morality of his society and his church. He did not find his answers in a laboratory, but through discernment, through the challenges of history, as he attempted to walk the path of discipleship. Franz was beheaded on August 9, 1943. He acted without any expectation that his stance would bring down the Third Reich or that anyone would even know or remember his sacrifice. In a journey faith, we don't know all the answers in advance. We have to pray, to reflect, to listen to how God is speaking to us through the events of history or the circumstances of our own life. As Pope Francis notes, our life is not given to us like an opera libretto in which it's all written down, but it means going, walking, doing, searching, seeing, we must enter into the adventure of the quest for meeting God. We must let God search and encounter us. God, he says, is encountered walking along the path. That last phrase brings to mind the story of the disciples who met the Lord on the path to Emmaus, though they didn't recognize him at first. Henry Nouwen used this story, as I mentioned, as the basis for one of his books, With Burning Hearts, which I, I published. The disciples meet this stranger on the road as they're experiencing dejection following the crucifixion of Jesus. They had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel and make all their dreams come true, and now he's dead. 
and yet the stranger, as he walks beside them, explains the deeper meaning of everything so that they feel their hearts burn within them. They ask him to stay with them. It's late. Night is coming. He breaks bread and blesses it, and only in this familiar gesture do they realize it's the Lord. And at that moment he disappears, and they hasten back to Jerusalem to tell the others what they've seen. It's not always in the moment that we realize that it's God who is meeting us on this path, in the guise of a stranger, in a word that makes our hearts burn, in an encounter with some great truth or ethical challenge that causes us to change direction. We were going in one direction, then suddenly something makes us turn around, we go in the other way. We do not know in the moment, or realize that God is there in our doubts, in the exam we failed, the job we lost, in the frustration of our heart's desire, in the loss of our friend. Sometimes there's an unmistakable sign of grace, a gesture, a voice that causes us to exclaim like the disciples, it's the Lord. But usually it's only when we look back that we can see this, the door that opened for us just as another one closed, the wisdom we received, the places in our hearts that did not previously exist but now exist because suffering or love or new life came into them through some unexpected direction. On a journey, we often don't realize that we've even begun. We certainly have no idea where it will end. Its entire character is defined by uncertainty, which calls for the exercise of truth, faith, and hope. In the case of so many saints, at least the ones who particularly interest me, those qualities had to substitute for maps. Thomas Merton made it clear in a, a famous prayer, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you'll lead me by the right road, though I may not know anything about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem lost, and in the shadow of death I will not fear, for you are with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. A similar attitude is reflected in a prayer that Henry Nouwen actually wrote four months before his death. I do not know where you will lead me. I do not know where I will be two, five, or ten years from now. I do not know the road ahead of me, but I know that you are with me to guide me, and that wherever you lead me, even where I would rather not go, you will bring me closer to my true home. Thank you, Lord, for my life, for my vocation, and for the hope that you have planted in my heart. Amen. It was that hope, planted in the hearts of the saints, rather than any handbook or manual of instructions that was their compass, leading them to their true home. And it was on that path that they encountered God. I explored many of these ideas, including reflections on Merton, Dorothy Day, and Henry Nouwen, in a deep correspondence I ex exchanged with Sister Wendy Beckett, an English hermit and for some time a famous art historian in the last three years of her life. Some of you might remember her from the period of her fame that came from a television program where she visited museums around the world and talked about paintings. She was a memorable sight in her medieval-looking habit. I recently published a collection of my letters with her in a book called Dearest Sister Wendy, A Surprising Story of Faith and Friendship. Sister Wendy lived in a cell within the enclosure of a Carmelite monastery in England where she rose each night at 9 p.m. and spent the rest of the night in silent prayer. Our correspondence began almost by accident. Sister Wendy at the time was dying of pulmonary fibrosis, which caused her lungs to harden, made it difficult for her to breathe. Yet she used her limited time to write me on an almost daily basis, reflecting on holiness, the life of faith, and the importance of recognizing the presence of God's love in the story of our lives. She urged me to recognize those signs not only in the obvious graces I had enjoyed, including the opportunity to know and write about holy people, but even in the most difficult ordeals of my life, my daughter's struggle with anorexia, the sad ending of a long marriage. In one early letter, feeling that I had to disabuse Sister Wendy of any 
image she had of me of an, as an ideal Catholic layman. I acknowledged these ordeals, and she responded that she was sorry to hear about this, but she said, Life's journey has unexpected twists and turns. We don't plot the journey, but we can respond to it as our Lord wants at every new surprise. It's allowing Him to be alive in us that matters, not what seems to be happening, but what He knows is happening. I've thought so much about that line. It's allowing Him to be alive in us that matters, not what seems to be happening, but what He knows is happening. Thinking about how that applies not only in my own life, but to all the people I've been talking about. Part of my friendship with Sister Wendy was built on our devotion to Dorothy Day, whom she believed was one of the great saints of our time. About Merton and Nowen, she had more complicated feelings. She admired them both, but reflected at length about their idiosyncrasies and struggles. She wrote, I am struck by a great similarity between Merton and Nowen. Amidst all his frustrations, angers, fears, and illusions, Merton struggled always toward God. In a less complex manner, Nowen struggled through his neediness always toward God. There are wonderful examples of how temperament can never stand in the way. Both were, in a sense, badly equipped to be holy, but their very weaknesses occasioned a longing and a love that the more balanced would not have. In one of her final letters to me, again comparing the two, she wrote, there is much self-deception and muddle in their lives, and yet there is an unwavering concentration on God. I think many people would find this very encouraging, that it's the direction that matters, the desire, and not the spiritual achievement, as it were. I do think there's a point in their heroic fixation, despite their weakness, on the only thing that matters. Whether in my own case, or in the case of these complicated spiritual teachers, I I take comfort in this thought that it, it's the direction that matters. But even in the case of the official saints whose holiness in retrospect seems to fit them like a tailored outfit, we can see how much they struggle to find their way, a model of discipleship appropriate to their own gifts or that responded to the needs of their time. Yet all of them started somewhere in some unremarkable way before venturing off the charts, taking a step into the unknown. No matter where our vocation lies, God is always calling us to go deeper. Mistakes and false steps are part of the process, not simply a deviation. As the Pope says, in this quest to seek and find God in all things, there's still an area of uncertainty. There must be. If a person says that he met God with total certainty and is not touched by a margin of uncertainty, then this is not good. If one has the answers to all the questions, that is proof that God is not with him. In this process, conversion is not a once-and-for-all election of faith. In most cases, it is really a choice that must be constantly renewed or recalibrated in the course of an ongoing journey, a process of growing constantly in our capacity to love through the exercise of mercy, compassion, forgiveness. Dorothy Day believed that every day she was being called to start again, and every day Jesus was asking her, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. As Thomas Merton wrote, we are not converted only once in our life, but many times. And this endless series of large and small conversions, inner revolutions, leads finally to our transformation in Christ. Looking back over my life, it's possible to construct a narrative arc in which my encounters, whether in person or through books with figures like Dorothy Day, the work of Thomas Merton or Henry Nouwen, have played central roles, drawing a straight line from my early youth right up to the present moment. But at any particular moment, it didn't seem that way. Often the true significance of events in our lives becomes clear only when we look back and see the path they illuminated. We go one step at a time. And occasionally those steps involve some dramatic gestures, such as when St. Francis kissed a leper. But as Dorothy Day said, sometimes it takes just one step. We would like to think so. And yet the older I get, the more I see that life is made up of many steps. They are very small affairs, not giant strides. I have kissed a leper not once but twice, consciously, and I can't say I'm any the better for it. Sometimes the providential twists and turns in my life have brought to mind the image of Tarzan swinging from one vine to another, the next one seemingly always at hand when he needed it, 
and that instills a sense of trust and hope in what will come. But that's only one side of the story. I could tell the story from a different perspective. The frequent times when my path was marked by obstacles, confusion, and desolation, when all I could do was stretch out my empty hand, and the only prayer I could utter was, Help. In the midst of my darkest anguish over the sufferings of my daughter, I came across a statement by Frederick Buchner, also writing about the ordeal of a daughter with anorexia. Writing of the presence of God in our lives, he says, This does not mean that God makes events happen to us, which move us in certain directions, like chessmen. Instead, events happen under their own steam as random as rain, which means that God is present in them not as their cause, but as the one who, even in the hardest and most hair-raising of them, offers us the possibility of that new life and healing, which I believe is what salvation is. If I look back on my life and wonder, where was God in this story? I can easily look at the great encounters, the opportunities, the doors that seemed to open just when I most needed them. But I have no doubt as I look back that God was also present in the times of failures, brokenness, and doubt. Perhaps a journey faith involves learning to trust what Buchner calls the possibility of new life and healing, even in the times when all seems dark and uncertain. I was blessed to work for some time with a holy Marian old priest, Father Steve DeMott, who served for many years among the poor in Chile. He was a a man who embodied the Beatitudes, especially the spirit of poverty, the practice of mercy, and the challenge of peace. At the age of 50, he was found to have an inoperable brain tumor. I found myself sitting next to him at a commemoration for the Marian old sisters who had died in El Salvador, and we were asked to turn to our neighbor and reflect on how we would live if we knew we would die the next day. And Steve remarked, Welcome to my world. We talked a lot about dying. I said I imagine he didn't have a lot of regrets. Oh, he said, he had a lot of regrets. He thought sometimes that he'd been given an art project to complete, and he had gone about it in an indifferent way, working a bit here, a bit there, with a lot of distraction. And suddenly a voice was saying, Time's up. And he felt such regret. But then he imagined Jesus saying to him, You know, Steve, it wasn't really about the art project. Often we measure our lives by what we've accomplished. The monuments we've built, the legacy we'll leave behind. But at the end, it's good to be reminded that it's not really about the art project, but about knowing and loving God and loving one another in the short time that's given to us in this life. As Sister Wendy said, It's allowing him to be alive in us that matters. Not what seems to be happening, but what he knows is happening. Or she said about Merton and Nowen, it's the direction that matters. And perhaps our progress on this journey is marked not by our skill in identifying and grasping the next vine, but learning to let go, as Henry Nowen put it, and trust in the catcher. Our lives are not written for us like a libretto, Pope says, we travel without any certainty of what lies ahead. Sometimes we travel with the sun on our backs and sometimes in darkness. Sometimes we seem to lose our way, but we do not travel alone. I've spent a large portion of my life reflecting on the saints, drawn not just by their heroic virtue and achievements, but by the story that God tells us through their lives. And by reading those stories, we may become more adept at discerning the presence of God in our own story. Many years ago, I happened to watch a Disney movie called The Other Side of Heaven, which tells the story of a young Mormon missionary in the South Pacific. After many trials and adventures, he writes to his fiancée back home and sums up the lessons he has learned, a line that's always stuck with me. There's a thread that connects heaven and earth, he says. If we find that thread, everything is meaningful, even death. If we don't find it, nothing is meaningful even life. Sometimes I feel that I've found that thread only to lose it the very next moment. It's a thread that runs through the lives of Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Henry Nouwen, Pope Francis, and many of the saints I've talked about, as it does through each of our lives, whether we acknowledge it or not. It's reminding us to be more loving, more truthful, more faithful in facing what the Pope calls the surprise of each day. 
to the extent that we respond to that reminder, as Jean-Pierre de Cossade wrote, our lives become a parchment. Our sufferings and our actions are the ink. The workings of the Holy Spirit are the pen. And with it, God writes a living gospel. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. I hope it's been meaningful to you and that we'll uh, introduce you not just to some of the people I've spoken about, but through them we'll inspire you and uh, motivate you to think more deeply about your own life and the living gospel uh, that it reflects. Thank you and God bless.